Today we're going to be talking about insurance. Certainly an incredibly fun and exciting thing to talk about, right? Insurance. But insurance certainly is very, very important in our life, if for nothing else than to give us complete peace of mind. I couldn't imagine how worried I would be knowing that if my 14-year-old son that loves to cook, if he caught the house on fire and it would burn down, I'd lose everything. If my son catches the house on fire, hopefully everybody gets out safely, it burns down, and then it is one big hassle in the rebuilding phase and getting it built again, but I know my insurance carrier is going to come in, rebuild the house, I'll probably be in a hotel paid by my insurance carrier for a while. Or a car. If I'm driving home from school today and I'm looking down at something, changing a CD or whatever, and I hit somebody, maybe I hit a person, and that person ends up in the hospital and it's eighty, ninety, two hundred thousand dollars of medical bills, I know that I don't have to come up with that two hundred thousand dollars. That that's gonna be come up by my insurance carrier. So the biggest thing we get in insurance is peace of mind, knowing that one mistake or misstep isn't going to destroy everything that we've worked for. So what is insurance? Basically, insurance is protection against a possible loss. And when we look at an insurance company, basically what the insurance company is in business to make money. And the product that they're going to sell you is basically risk sharing. You give them some of your risk. So now they have the risk of your house burning down. And why the heck are they going to shoulder the risk of your house burning down? Because you're going to send them a premium. You're going to send them $800 or $600 or whatever that is. And they are going to take on that risk for you. All right. So. What are some of the procedures? First off, we're going to go out and we're going to write a policy or we're going to get a policy. And within that policy, it's going to delineate all my coverages. So I need to be able to read that. You know, how much is it going to pay if the house burns down? If someone breaks in and steals all your stuff, how much are they going to pay? Are there limitations on things that they're going to pay? Like typically within a policy, they say, we'll cover your contents of your house for 20% of the value of your house. So if your house is worth $400,000, they'll cover only $80,000 of merchandise within your house. And there tends to be further limitations where they say, we will only spend up to $1,500 on your quote unquote collections of whatever it is. So if you've got a $100,000 stamp collection or an $80,000 uh, coin collection, you have to get what's called a rider and buy more coverage if you want insurance on those items. And so you want to look at what all those exclusions are. And certainly they will write an exclusion or what's also called a rider where they will give you $100,000 worth of coverage on collections, but they'll obviously charge you a premium because they're taking that risk. And that might be something that uh, works out very well for you. So let's talk about a couple of the common terms. One is a risk, right? The chance of loss or injury. So basically, you dying is a risk. We then have what's called a peril. A peril is anything that causes that thing to happen, right? Wind, storm, robbery, getting shot. Right? The peril is getting shot. The risk is me dying. And then we have the hazard. A hazard is anything that increases the likelihood of the peril to happen in which then the risk occurs of you dying. So one of the hazards that I don't face an awful lot of times, especially on drunk drivers, I'm not out on the road at 2 a.m. very often. So therefore, I try not to face that hazard. And if I don't face that hazard, then I am not put in peril nearly as often as other people are, although certainly there's drunks driving around at 2 in the afternoon. We all know that. 
which then really reduces my risk of dying or getting hurt severely within an accident. So, what are the most common types of uh, risk? Well, certainly loss of income or life. I die. Um, loss of income is I get hurt. I get hurt in a car accident. I can't work. I no longer get a paycheck. And so something needs to come in to pay for that, whether that's state disability, federal disability, or a private disability policy I have through my employer or someone else. We have property risks, right? Property risk is basically my property is destroyed or stolen. And we also have here what are called liability risks. Liability risks mean I did something stupid and because I did something stupid, someone else got hurt or someone else's property got destroyed. And when you're negligent, you have to pay for that. So if we look at a couple things, I'll give you a, uh, a story of, of, of negligence and then also how negligence can grow. If you're a volunteer, typically you're shielded from basic negligence. Not always, but typically. So what could that mean? That could mean you're playing baseball and you've got a whole bunch of nine-year-olds and the bases are loaded and up steps the biggest, heaviest hitter, bottom of the ninth inning, although nine-year-olds don't play nine innings, but bottom of the ninth inning, and so you take your third baseman and you move him five steps forward so that this big hitter, he can feel the ball and throw the person out at home plate. But the big kid, who's the best hitter in the league, smashes the ball, hits the nine-year-old in the head. Every single coach is probably going to get called for negligence on that. That's just incredibly negligent, um, dealing with a nine-year-old. When we determine negligence, we have what's called a reasonable man theory. What would a reasonable person in that position do? And it changes. And this is why there's lots of lawsuits. And there's and different people can come to different reasonable conclusions. Some people would say, yeah, no, no problem moving that kid up to cut off the run. Most people would probably say, the kid's nine. What are you doing? It's, a, it's, just, it's just a double A little league game. What, what's going on? Much different than if it's the CIF championships high school varsity baseball and it's the bottom of the ninth bases are loaded this basically is for the entire southern california championships you move that third baseman forward who is a 17 year old kid still a minor but 17 years old six foot two and a phenomenal athlete and you're starting third baseman and he gets hit in the head probably not going to be considered negligence some other places of negligence that you need to be uh, aware of. If you have a friend over at your house and you serve that person alcohol and that person gets drunk, you are negligent in serving alcohol until that person gets drunk. If they fall down the stairs outside, that's your fault. If they run into a tree with their car, that's their fault. I'm sorry, that's your fault. If, and it's their fault also. Um, if they get in a DUI and someone gets killed and they want to trace it back to the fact that you gave them five drinks and then handed them their keys, you could be potentially looking at manslaughter, um, let alone being sued or anything like that back for your negligence. So there's negligence, basic negligence, especially in a volunteer situation, um, you tend to be shielded from. Uh, basic negligence would be back to that baseball analogy. You got, you got a kid that comes up who's the last batter, who's not very good. And, he stri and, and you move your third baseman in five or six steps, they strike out. Up comes the next batter who is the leadoff batter and one of the best batters in the league. And you forget to move that kid back five or six steps. Odds are that's just going to be basic negligence. You should have moved him back. Easy to make that mistake. If you're a volunteer in that situation, you're probably shielded. 
if you're a coach on a travel team and that coach is getting paid and they're a paid professional, odds are no. You know, they're, they're going to get hit and they're going to be liable. Um, even if you're a volunteer, you are responsible for what's called gross negligence. And I'll give you a story where I actually had to quit as a coach of a baseball team um, that my kids were on that really bothered me. Um, we had one kid on the team that was just a problem player. And he had attitude problems and everything else, and we had benched him a few times. And his mom was upset because now he wasn't getting his league-mandated innings because he was such a problem. And we would put this kid in, and sometimes he'd be out in center field, and he would take his glove, and he'd put his glove up over his head and pout. And so we'd look out there and go, whatever. You know, kid wants to stand out there. That's his issue. Well, then it came time for him because he only wanted to play in the infield. So then it came time for his infield innings. Um, he picked up a ground ball, threw it to third base when he's th supposed to throw it to second. Wrong base. Small kid, nine years old. People make mistakes, no big deal. He gets so upset that now standing at shortstop, he sticks his glove over his face. Now comes the next kid up to bat. And we can't get this kid to take his glove off his face. The manager refused to pull the kid out of the game. And I looked at him and said, you cannot leave a defenseless kid with his glove over his face, standing at shortstop with these baseball players. We're playing a really good team who are just going to tee off. That kid's going to get hurt. And so at, at the second pitch, I actually quit because I felt at that point, we were committing gross negligence, which meant I am opened up for a lawsuit and I would lose even though I was a volunteer. There's no way, in my opinion, anybody could justify leaving that kid in. And if that kid got hurt, that's totally on us. So you got to keep that in mind. If you're volunteering for an organization, you want to find out what their insurance coverages are. Um, and be mindful of what they're expecting you to do. Um, and certainly when you do stuff with kids, kids always get hurt. They do. You, you play t-ball and kids get hurt. You play football and kids get hurt. But would a reasonable person think that what you're doing is reasonable? All right? It might be very reasonable to take a whole bunch of kids down some rapids that are mild rapids during, uh, during the summertime. You know, what, during late in the summer when there's not a lot of snow melt, when they've never done it before. It might be incredibly unreasonable at the start of summer with lots of water flow and horrifically big rapids. You might look at that and say, this is unreasonable to take these kids down this river. It is just too dangerous. And in that point, you've got to speak up to keep yourself protected. All right, so that's liability. All right. There's a couple of different types of risks also. One is called pure risk. Pure risk means that is a risk I take and there is no benefit to it. Like my car being stolen. There's no benefit to me if my car gets stolen. There's no benefit to me if I break my leg. Now, some people may say, hey, if my car gets stolen, I get a new car, right? Well. Your car gets stolen that was worth $5,000. They hand you $5,000. You're in the same place, right? There's no upside. Speculative risk has upside. I go to Vegas. I put $5,000 on black. We spin the wheel. If it lands on red, I lost. If it lands on black, I just doubled up my money. If it lands on green, the house takes everything. So. As long as there is upward potential, then it is an uninsurable risk. I can't, I am unable to insure my bets in Vegas. I cannot insure my bets at the sport book. I also cannot insure bets that I make in the stock market where I put $100,000 on General Electric and now it's gone down and I want someone to cover those losses, right? There's upward potential. Instead of losing 10, 20,000, I might have made 10, 20, 30,000 dollars. 
Okay. All right, this is kind of all the different ways that we can deal with risk. The worst thing we can really do is to take a risk and not even realize we took that risk. There's some great danger out there that we're blind to. And so we want to be able to look at all our risks. And so what are some ways to manage risk? Well, one thing we could do is risk avoidance. Um, you know, the odds of me being killed jumping out of an airplane are incredibly small because I really don't plan on jumping out of an airplane. Um, I could avoid risk of drowning by not swimming. But certainly we cannot avoid all risks. And so we engage then a lot of times in what's called risk reduction. And I mentioned this before, I am not on the road very much after two o'clock because I remember how much I drank and was on the road when I was 20, 22, 23. And I don't want to be out there when all of you guys are out there driving around. So to make myself safer driving, I don't drive late at night like that. I always wear my seatbelt. I buy a car that has a five-star crash rating. Um, I tend not to weave in and out of traffic. It's a lot of things. I try to keep my eye open for other people who are going to run into me. So I do a lot of things to try to reduce that risk. And then there are some risks that we just have to assume. So there's a lot of things that I love to do. I like rock climbing. I work out. You know, rock climbing is a very dangerous sport. There's certain things that I try to do there to mitigate that risk, but I just know that that's a risk that I'm going to take, and I get a lot more benefit emotionally, physically, out of doing that than I would out of avoiding it. And then we get into what's called risk shifting. Okay? Risk shifting basically says, here's this huge risk. I don't want to take it but yet I still want to engage in that activity, so I'm going to shift that risk onto another person, i.e. an insurance carrier, and get them to cover it in case bad things happen. And they accept that risk for a premium. And within that premium, there tends to be what's called a deductible. Deductibles are part of you assuming some of that risk. So like on your car, most people have either a $500 or $2,000 or $2,500 deductible on their car. Mine happens to be $5,000. So what I say is if I get in a car wreck, I will cover the first $5,000. The insurance company will pick up everything after $5,000. I get a pretty good discount by me assuming the first $5,000 worth of risk. Other people assume only $500. We couldn't have a zero deductible on everything, including door dings. Can you imagine how expensive auto insurance would be if every time you got a door ding in a student parking lot or at a mall, you'd look at it and go, hey, I'm going to take this down to the insurance carrier and have this door ding pulled out and have that whole door repainted. And that probably happened twice a year. You'd probably see your insurance go up $1,000 just to cover door dings. And we don't want to pay 1000 bucks for door dings, right? So I'm going to assume that risk. There are some things where I might take a decision and assume all of the risk of apparel because I think it's in my financial best interest to do so especially within a business. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slide over to the board right now and give you one of those examples. We're going to cover risk assumption. Insurance companies are willing to assume risk because you're going to pay them to take that risk. The insurance company has to pay off whatever the risk is and the peril. They've also got to cover their overhead and they also have to make profits. So if you can set up a system to assume the risk in a logical manner without hurting yourself too much, 
then more likely than not, you're going to come out way ahead of the game. So let me give you an example. When I was working at an antique store, we did a lot of wholesale. We brought in containers from England, from Germany, some stuff from South America, but, but primarily Europe. And we had a container come in pretty much every other week. We got about 24 containers every single year, right? A 40-foot container. So we got about 24 containers a year. And each of these containers had about $45,000 worth of merchandise, okay? So let's just make it easy and say that $40,000 worth of merchandise. To get an insurance policy to cover this $40,000 cost us $1,500. Now, it covered this container in case this container got lost at sea, got stolen on the way to the port, got stolen after it got dropped off to our place before we were able to get this thing unloaded and in. And so, these containers, if you see them, they got wheels on the back. A lot of times they're also called piggybacks on the water. But they'll load them up and ship them, and they'll bring them to our place. We basically bought everything online, or we went over, and we would send buyers over there. They'd send us photos, and we'd purchase these items. All right? Well, $1,500 is a lot of money to insure a $40,000 container. And the way the insurance was set up, it was $1,500 for $100,000 worth of coverage. And then each next 100000 cost you 500 bucks. All right? So it was just kind of the basic type of insurance you bought. You want to insure your container for $100,000, you paid $1,500. The pure loss ratio of these was around $400, but they got their salespeople, overhead, profit, so they have to make the money. And so the question comes about in this first one was, do we want to buy insurance for these containers? Are we better off not buying insurance for these containers? And so we went back and looked and tried to figure out how many containers we're losing every single year or every single three years. So the first thing that we're going to do is take $1,500, divide it into $40,000 to see how many containers we have to go to actually break even. So I'm going to take $40,000 divided by $1,500, and that gets us... 26.6. So we were getting two a month. We were getting about 24 containers a year. And so if we lost one container a year, we would lose a little bit of money. If we went, say, 18 months between losing containers, we would make more money. And so I talked to our boss into saying, hey, you know what we should do? We need to open up another fund. And so we actually opened up a bank account. And every time we brought a container in, we stopped buying insurance. And we dropped the $1,500 into a savings fund. This is also called self-insurance when you start doing self-insurance. When you're doing this, a couple things, business-wise, you have to make sure. A, what happens if I lose the first container? Am I out of business? What if I lose the first two containers? How much trouble am I in? And so we came up with three basic policies that we felt to protect ourselves. One is we did not have more than one container on any ship. And the reason we didn't want more than one container on any ship is so that if the ship goes down, we don't lose two containers that are uninsured. The other thing that we did is we trained our employees very, very highly and said, you know what, 
when these things get delivered, you need to unload them that day. Nothing stays in the container. Because all the merchandise that was in this container is uninsured. Once the container was unloaded and the merchandise, whatever that merchandise might be, was placed into our warehouse, we were then covered by theft insurance. The third thing that we did is we told all the delivery companies, we will not take delivery after 3 o'clock and we will not take delivery on the weekends because we need to get the container early enough in the day that we can unload everything and get it into the warehouse because there's lots and lots of rings that go around and steal trailers and that worked very well all right we also brought in containers which in the industry we call them smalls it's a 40 foot container but what you do is you have all the small stuff on it. Figurines, silver, little rocking chairs, china, silver tea servings, cups, saucers, serving platters, all that type of stuff. And all that little stuff adds up really fast when you're looking at space. Versus say putting in beds, armoires, nightstands. Those take up a lot more room and are a lot less valuable per square foot. The small containers that we had coming in typically had $750,000 of merchandise on them. And so when we looked at these containers, we tried to say, if we lost that container, would it significantly impact our business? And the answer to that was yes. We typically don't have $750,000 within that business that we could absorb. We could absorb $40,000. We wouldn't like it, but we certainly could absorb it. We would really struggle at absorbing $750,000. Plus, how much does it cost us to insure $750,000? Well, $1,500 for the first $100,000, and then the next Seven hundred thousand at five hundred per hundred thousand costs us three thousand five hundred. So that's three thousand five hundred plus fifteen hundred for the first hundred thousand gets us five thousand dollars to insure a container that's worth seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Plus, we're only bringing in two of these typically a year sometimes three, rarely four, but typically we were bringing in two. So then what we need to do is take 5,000, divide 5,000 into 750,000, and then divide by two as far as those are the number coming in every year, and pretty soon you see to break even, we can't lose one of these for... I think I calculated it out, about 75 years. And so it's going to hurt too much. The payoff's not there. And so we made the decision, these high-value containers, we're going to insure. And so these we insured. In a 10-year period, we took in 24 containers per year times 10 was... 240 containers. Of those 240 containers, we lost three on the, uh, in the entire 10 years. One of the containers we lost when a ship went down. It's certainly nothing we could do about that. Another container we lost when a ship started to list to the side and the captain made the decision that he was going to unhook a bunch of containers and using their cranes just started tossing containers off into the ocean. He tossed a couple hundred containers to rewrite his ship. And our container was one of the few hundred that got tossed off. And so a lot of people then would think, well, hey, can't you sue and get that back? 
No, that's why you're supposed to have insurance. The captain of a ship that's in trouble is trying to save the lives and souls on the ship. They can pretty much do anything. The right move for that captain was to toss everything over the side as much as he could. And he did save the ship and save the crew. So that was the good move. Our third container that we lost was purely our screw up. We had a, a trailer that came in real late on a Wednesday night, right before closing. We closed at 8, came in at 7.30 to drop off a container. We said, hey, we don't take deliveries late at night. We just don't do it. And it happened to be the uh, Wednesday before Thanksgiving. And next thing you know, the driver's crying. The driver's showing photos of his family and everything. And our guy feels horrible because he was going to deadhead back to Salt Lake City so he could see his family for Thanksgiving. But if we didn't take it and we're close Thanksgiving, then he misses Thanksgiving and he delivers on Friday. And so our guy said, okay, sign, took the trailer, set the trailer there. Six hours later, the trailer's stolen. Part of, I'm sure, a ring. That guy got back into his cab. Odds are he called somebody who called somebody who said, hey, I dropped off a trailer in front of an antique store, probably a lot of high value items. And so we didn't even follow our own policy. Very upsetting. I wasn't really happy with the employee, but that employee was an incredibly good employee. He was a family person also, feeling very empathetic for this guy who wants to see his family on Thanksgiving. And so we just really reiterated to everybody, you cannot take these deliveries. And we didn't fire the person or anything. I mean, we all make mistakes. That's what happens. And so we lost in three containers at about $40,000 each, $120,000 in a 10-year period. We also then took 240 containers times 1500 and we ended up with $360,000. So we had about $360,000 in this fund. We subtract out our losses, and we're not doing too bad here. We're to the good $240,000. Over a 10-year period, we saved by not paying this extra money in insurance premiums. If you're not going to buy insurance for something, this is the type of thinking that you need to do. Sit down with the numbers, run the numbers, and does it make sense? Occasionally, I don't have theft on my car. Um, sometimes my cars aren't worth all that much. They're worth a couple thousand bucks theft and comprehensive, maybe it's going to cost me $150, $200 for the year. And I say, you know what? For $500, bucks, i am going to keep this car for maybe three years. If it gets stolen, I'm not that much more ahead of the game. I am going to take that risk because I think it's the right financial decision. The worst type of thing to do is say, you know what? These $40,000 containers... We are so broke, we cannot afford to buy insurance. Once you get into a position where you cannot afford to buy insurance and you're taking risks you really don't want to, that's a totally different animal and you're probably in trouble. The more money you have, the more risk you can take. And so, while I'm in a pretty decent financial position, I have $5,000 deductibles on my car and $5,000 deductible on my house. The reason I do that is my premiums are really low. But I can sustain a car accident and a house problem. Maybe if I drive my car into the house, right? I'll lose 10,000 bucks. I can afford to sustain that, so therefore, I save a little over $1,000 a year on my insurance. As long as I can go five years without an auto accident, five years without a house claim, I am ahead of the game. And currently so far, knock on wood, I'm still ahead of the game. 
All right. So this would be risk assumption. And this type of thing works whether it's a business, whether it's yourself, or anything else. So I would like to uh, thank you. And that's going to be the end of insurance. Have a great day.